This presentation, titled Improve Your Audit Score, How to Prevent the Top Audit Nonconformances, comes to us from Jeff Chilton. Jeff has more than 30 years of experience in the food industry, specializing in food safety, quality assurance, and plant management. Prior to his current role as Vice President Consulting for Intertech Alchemy, he was the founder and president of Chilton Consulting Group for 18 years, helping clients achieve and sustain GFSI certification under the SQF, BRC, and FSSC 22,000 standards, along with USDA and FDA regulatory compliance services for HACCP and Food Safety Plan. Jeff is a certified SQF auditor, an SQF consultant, a preventive control for human food lead instructor, and an international HACCP Alliance lead instructor. Prior to starting Chilton Consulting Group, he was a plant manager at two large food processing companies and a director of quality assurance. He earned his bachelor's degree in marketing and management from Tampa College. And with that, take it away, Jeff. Okay, thank you very much. And welcome to the Food Safety Expo. I look forward to sharing information with you today regarding how to improve your audit score by preventing the top 10 audit nonconformances. Since everyone would like to improve their audit scores, you are in the right place. As quality professionals, we all strive for continuous improvement in our operations. The average number of nonconformances during SQF audits is six and a half. What if you could prevent those other two to three nonconformances? You could have an opportunity to raise your audit rating from good to excellent or comply to good. We have a great presentation with a lot of information to help you do just that. The best way to improve your audit score is to learn from the mistakes of others and not repeat the same issues in your facility. Let's quickly review what we plan to cover today. First, we will discuss the significance of the audit process and challenges associated with audits. Secondly, we will take time to discuss the top 10 nonconformances and ways to prevent them. Third, we will discuss what steps to take when nonconformances are found. Fourth, I'll share some best practices for ensuring compliance with audit standards. Fifth, we'll discuss how to prepare for audits in advance so you are well ready along with the steps to take during and after the audit. At last, I'll quickly share about resources that Intertech Alchemy offers the industry. Third-party audits are an important component of your food safety and quality systems. Love them or hate them, they are here to stay. So you may as well make the most of it. Good audits are risk-based and help prevent foodborne illness outbreaks and product recalls. It's best to treat each audit as a learning experience to help continuously improve your food safety and quality systems. Obviously, there's a lot of pressure associated with the audits. Customers expect good scores so you can remain an eligible vendor to supply product to them. Senior management expects good scores so they do not lose business. One frustrated QA manager recently shared with me that they lost over $8,000 of their compensation package due to their most recent audit score and rating. Now that's a lot of pressure. Trends of audits are also reviewed regularly to assess continuous improvement over the years. Of course, the main goal is to stay audit ready every day. Even though the audit result may only be a small snapshot of time, it's critically important to follow the same procedures and maintain sanitary conditions the other 362 days of the year as well. There are many challenges related to do well during audits. First off, the audit standards are frequently changing. By the time you get used to one standard, it changes. GFSI standards are required to be updated at least every three years but program owners may choose to do it more often. The GFSI benchmarking document is scheduled to be updated again this month in February 2020. SQF, BRC, FSSC 22000, and other program owners will have to update their standards to comply next year. SQF is expected to publish their edition 9.0 by September 2020, with implementation required in early 2021. 
In addition, there are ongoing challenges for plants to keep personnel properly trained, equipment in good condition, and building and facilities in good repair to meet audit requirements. Next, inconsistency of auditors can create significant challenges. Of course, auditors are required to rotate at least every three years. We recently worked with a new packaging manufacturing client that had been SQF certified for five years with good ratings each year. Then a new auditor came in and issued over 30 non-conformances, including two majors, causing them to fail their recertification audit. The system that everyone thought had been okay for five years was, bam, suddenly unacceptable. Of course, the lesson learned is to not become complacent with a particular auditor. You must make sure that your system meets the code requirements all the time, and not just based on one auditor's interpretation. When I asked a large audience recently if this had ever been an issue in their plants, over 70% acknowledged a similar problem. And then last, unannounced audits also reinforce the need to remain audit ready every day. Now, drum roll please. And here is your list of the top 10 items cited, cited as major non-conformances during food safety audits. It's very alarming that three of the top major non-conformances are related to the company's food safety plan. This is the most critical element of your food safety system, so we've got to start getting this right. Food safety plans or HACCP plans must follow the 12-step pro process of Codex HACCP with the five preliminary steps and seven principles of HACCP. This must include complete identification of all potential hazards, correct CCP, critical control points, or preventive control identification, validated critical limits, and other fully implemented procedures for monitoring, corrective action, verification, and record keeping. Food safety plans or HACCP plans must also meet regulatory requirements in the countries of production and distribution. Secondly, there was a huge spike in the number of foreign material recalls and volume of product recalled in 2019. We also have an opportunity to improve our foreign material prevention programs and assure that metal detectors are properly monitored, verified, and validated as effective. There are several other notable nonconformances on this list, including pest control issues, poor sanitation, and ineffective pre-op inspections, equipment conditions, maintenance PM completion, CAPA processes, and food legislation compliance. This is a list of the top 10 items cited as minor nonconformances. You can see many of the same issues related to the food safety plan, equipment, sanitation, and maintenance. However, you can also see additional items on this list, including issues surrounding employee product handling, record keeping issues, building and facility issues, addressing the floors, walls, ceilings, and doors and window protection, and a minor nonconformance involving the food defense plan and the challenge test that has to be completed with it, at least on an annual basis. Some of the interesting takeaways from this list when comparing it to similar lists that have been issued in prior years is to take a look at what's dropped off the list and what's been added to it, along with the repeat issues that continually plague the industry. Fortunately, for those items that have dropped off the list, we have seen improvements in the programs and the implementation of those programs related to environmental monitoring, food fraud, internal audits, management review, and validation and effectiveness. Those items that are new to the list include food legislation, and there are some key requirements that have been added to the codes that require you not to only comply with the requirements of the regulations, but you also must notify the certification bodies and the program owners in the event of a recall. 
Additional items that were new to the list are continuing problems with floors that have been upgraded even to major nonconformances at times and maintenance problems where typically in this area, all of the equipment may not be included in the preventive maintenance schedule or the other issue is not following the PM programs the way that it's been written. The repeat issues that seem to stay on this list year after year after year include these issues around the food safety plan and the food defense plan, as we talked about, particularly completing the challenge test. Cleaning and sanitation is an ongoing issue to make sure that you have effective sanitation programs in place, but also that you have effective procedures in place to verify the effectiveness of the sanitation process, including the swabbing with ATP and other types of swab results to prove that it's working the way that it should. And then there's always a number of building and facility issues, particularly around walls and door, dust, insect and press prevention, which often relates to door sills in the facilities and particularly around shipping doors. And then other issues around the equipment itself and the utensils. There's frequently issues around equipment with conveyor belts that are utilized on the equipment and frayed edges on the side of the equipment or other issues with the equipment that could potentially introduce a foreign material contaminant. And the same thing for plastic utensils as well. The next item on this list is the staff engaged in food handling. And in other words, what we're talking about here is the area of how the employees are handling the product and whether or not they could introduce a contaminant to that product in the way that it's being handled. And then we'll be talking in more detail about the detection of foreign objects and making sure that you have effective foreign material control procedures in place and also able to be able to detect those foreign objects in the event they enter your production stream. And then there's ongoing issues with record keeping requirements and making sure that you have employees trained to properly fill out records in a complete, accurate, and timely manner. And then last, issues around pest prevention, which it's now called. It's not pest control, but now we do call it pest prevention to make sure that we're doing all the actions that are necessary to make sure that we keep pest out of our food processing facilities. Over these next few slides, I wanna take a little bit deeper dive into these areas that are causing the major non-conformances. So let's start with the food safety plan. Again, we talked about the food safety plan being the most critical part of your food safety system. And it's also one of the most critical parts of your audit criteria as well. So let's take a look at some of these individual details that need to be addressed as part of your food safety plan. And it all starts with your HACCP or your food safety team and the individual that you've identified to be able to manage that process. You should have a list of your HACCP or food safety team members that includes not only the names of the individuals that are serving on the team, but also their title and their experience and the training that they've received so that they can make meaningful contributions to your food safety plans. This team should also meet on a regular schedule, at least quarterly, with documented minutes of those meetings, and more often if necessary, if there are issues within the facility. And then let's look at the components of what has to be included in your HACCP plan or your food safety plan. And it starts with a product description to where you identify the category of the products that are gonna be included within the HACCP plan and key characteristics for those products. Secondly, the flow chart is an important part of it. And many times nonconformances are cited related to the flow chart due to process steps that are missing from the flow chart. The types of steps that are missing most often include rework or recouping steps. So a product is sorted out at a packaging process and then it has to be opened up and repackaged or even blended back in at an earlier part of the process. Those types of rework and recouping steps need to be included on the flowcharts themselves. Other steps that are commonly missing on flowcharts are inputs to the process. So things such as ice and water, CO2, and even gases that may be used during the packaging operation, such as nitrogen for gas flush packaging, all of these need to be included on the flow chart. The next major step of your HACCP plan would be your hazard analysis. 
And the most often known problem with a hazard analysis process is not identifying all the hazards that could be associated with the process itself. So you need to make sure that you identify all the physical, the biological, and the chemical hazards that could occur. And if you must comply with the FDA preventive control for human food rule, then also to identify radiological hazards, economically motivated adulterants, and the possibility of pathogen contamination from the environment as well. And then of course, the last part is to be the summary of the critical control points and the preventive controls that are identified. So in the summaries of these procedures, it would include all of your implementation procedures for the critical limits that have been identified, along with the monitoring, the corrective action, the verification, and the record keeping procedures that are required to be a part of the process itself. The last issue that we frequently see with the food safety plan is improper validation support. So you definitely need to have supporting scientific documentation in place to be able to support the critical controls that have been identified, the types of hazards that have been identified, and also the critical limits to show that they're gonna be sufficient to control those hazards that have been identified. And then the last few things to consider related to your food safety plan would be making sure that your employees are ready for interview processes. So you can always count on an auditor asking to interview any employee that has direct responsibility to monitor or verify a critical control point or a preventive control. So therefore, you wanna make sure that they can adequately demonstrate how they do their job and answer any questions that the auditor has competently as well. And then for the CCP records to make sure that they're filled out in a complete, accurate, and timely way. And then last, of course, you have to do at least an annual reassessment of your food safety plan and it's often recommended to have a third party involved in that process to make sure that you don't overlook anything internally. The next major program that we want to talk about briefly would be pest prevention. And it's critical to eliminate pest activity within our food processing plants. And when we're talking about pests, it's not just rodents, although certainly that could be a major concern, but there could be other types of pests that could be an issue as well. And this could include ants, flies, spiders, Indian mill moths, birds, or even other insects as well. And as you noted in some of the minor nonconformances, you did see a, one of the most cited minor nonconformances was related to SQF code 11271 for bad seals around doors, windows, and exterior openings. So if we're gonna do a good job to actually prevent pests and not just control pests within your facility, it's critically important to make sure that we have effective seals that'll keep pests out of your processing plants. The last area that I would really encourage you to take a look at would include the warehouses. And as an SQF auditor myself, when I go into SQF plants to do audits themselves, then I'll frequently go to each of the corners of the warehouses and look up and down those corners all the way from the floor to the ceiling with a good flashlight and oftentimes we see issues with webbing in the corners and insects in those areas too. So you wanna make sure that your master sanitation schedule covers those areas to make sure that you have an effective process in place to clean those on a routine basis and have proper documentation that the cleaning was actually done. And these are all steps that you can take to make your pest prevention program more robust and to help avoid these types of non-conformances in your facility. The next major program to talk about would be our cleaning and sanitation programs, which is a fundamental part of your food safety system as well. So within your written sanitation program, we do have to have processes in place to define how are you gonna clean your facility, including what methods you'll use to clean specific pieces of equipment and what type of chemicals and sanitizers will be used on that equipment itself. The written program should also talk about who's gonna perform those pre-op inspections to make sure that someone is checking the equipment to make sure that we actually do have clean food contact surfaces and environmental processing areas as well. And then last, for those areas that are clean less than daily, then we need to make sure those are addressed in a master sanitation schedule that defines the frequency of the cleaning 
and then make sure that you document that cleaning that has been performed on schedule. One of the most common areas where I've cited nonconformances for cleaning and sanitation is on the lack of verification methods that all of the code standards do require you to have methods to verify the effectiveness of your sanitation process. And typically this should go above and beyond just visual inspection of the areas themselves. So you would want to include some type of verification methods for ATP testing, which may give you immediate results to be able to show whether the surface is clean or not, but also APC for aerobic plate count to where you can actually get a quantified number for the amount of bacteria that may be on that surface and also environmental testing programs in place too for light zones two, three, and four for non-food contact surfaces, processing environments, and even non-processing environments to make sure there's not an issue with environmental pathogens. Other types of non-conformances that are often related to cleaning and sanitation are around chemical control and handling. And I can't count the number of non-conformances that have been cited due to finding a empty bottle of chemicals with no labels or a bottle that actually contains chemicals, but it doesn't have a label on it to identify what type of chemical is inside the bottle. And not only just a spray bottle or a container, but even some of the foaming equipment and some of the other issues that can contain chemical as well. So it is critically important to make sure that you have all chemicals properly labeled at all time and that ultimately you maintain your sanitation records for the master sanitation schedule and also for your daily pre-op inspection records. And next, let's talk about the detection of foreign objects because this is a major issue for the food industry right now. And if you go back and look at the data of product recalls that occurred during 2019, you'll notice a huge spike, not only in the number of recalls, but also the volume of the product that was recalled due to foreign material issues, approaching as much as 15 million pounds of product last year. So this is an area that we certainly need to pay a lot of attention to, to how can we properly prevent foreign material in our products itself. And then for the control processes that we have in place, how to make sure that these are working effectively as well. So specifically, this will get into your metal detector or other type of physical contaminant detection monitoring, which may include x-rays or screens or sieves or other types of methods that you could use to keep foreign material out. But you're obviously, you need to have a written program that states what you're going to use and define the procedures of how often it's going to be monitored and verified and then validate that the limits that you're using are going to be acceptable to be able to keep your foreign material issues under control. The second area that I address on this slide talks about the isolation of the defective product and an indication of product rejections. I was doing one SQF audit where I was watching product go through the metal detector and this was happened to be a cookie dough product that was in a pail or a tub and the plant would put the seeded one on top of an individual pail of cookie dough and the metal detector would actually detect it but the reject arm at the end of that belt actually allowed the container that was detected to have metal to pass straight through in the products stream, and then it would reject the wrong container or product. So you need to make sure that not only your metal detectors are working properly, but also the rejection mechanisms are working in time with the items that actually need to be rejected itself. And again, if you have this identified as a critical control point or process preventive control, this is certainly gonna be verified during your audits. Last, I would take a look at the employee competency to be able to demonstrate those tests. Make sure that your employees are well trained and that they're able to show the auditor exactly how to do the test that's in compliant with what your written program requires and also that they're able to document the results of that test properly. And this includes if they have a failure that in the event that it doesn't detect one of the seeded wands or it rejects on container or product, employees need to be able to properly communicate what actions they would take in that event and also how that would be documented. And then last, let's talk about the equipment and utensils themselves, that this is often a challenge to be able to maintain these in acceptable condition in food processing plants. We talked about making sure that the belts don't have frayed edges and that there's not other issues with either the equipment 
or any of the plastic utensils that could be used that could introduce foreign material contaminants to the product itself. So maintaining the equipment with a good PM program is critically important. And then inspecting that equipment every single day as part of that pre-op process is important for you as well. The second item on this slide talks about a requirement for a new documented procedure. And this has caused a lot of nonconformances during audits over the course of the last year. But the code does require you to actually have a written procedure that talks about purchasing equipment, materials, and protective clothing, all three of those items, to make sure that they are actually acceptable for food grade and that they're going to be suitable for intended use. So there needs to be a documented procedure to show what requirements you would have in place for this and to make sure that it's going to work the way that it's supposed to as well. One of your very best friends that you can have as part of your food safety and quality process should be your internal audit inspection process. And that should help address the facility itself for the building and the repairs and along with the equipment and the utensils in addition to the way that the employees are handling the products to make sure that they're complying with good manufacturing practice requirements, product handling, and product labeling requirements. And then last, using your PM programs and work orders and plan improvement programs to be able to manage that process. And that's where your maintenance program comes in. So you have to have a well-documented maintenance program that includes a PM schedule that not only addresses just the equipment that's included in the facility, but also the building and how you're going to re maintain the building itself. And then to make sure that you document the PM records at the correct frequencies as identified by the program itself to make sure that you're following the program the way that it's written. If you're not using it already, there's several good software programs that can help you document these PM systems or otherwise you'll have to rely on manual records to be able to still show that you're following the way the programs, the way that they're written. As an auditor, I can also tell you during every single audit, I'll always want to make sure to talk to maintenance mechanics as well and to get their input about what actions they're going to take in the event that a piece of equipment breaks down during production and in the event that that food contact surface becomes contaminated during the repair process, how are they going to manage that to make sure that that's communicated to production and to make sure that that area is going to be cleaned and sanitized and reinspected prior to release and production. So make sure that all the mechanics are ready for those types of interviews. And then of course on the work order and the PM programs to make sure that you have proper documentation to show that er everything has been cleaned after maintenance has been performed and also a tools and parts accountability through that process. And a few of the other nonconformances that you saw on those top 10 lists of minor and major nonconformances include the records themselves. And it's always a challenge to get employees to fill out records properly, but to make sure that all the monitoring checks are documented when they're supposed to be, and that all the records are actually complete. So everything's filled out the way that it's supposed to be, that it's accurate, that you've met all the limits and the requirements that you have. Also that it's timely, so the checks are being actually performed and documented at the frequency specified in the program. And then last, that it would be legible, that you can actually read what's on the record to make sure that you can correlate that with the result and the person who completed the record. And then we've talked about these other items related to the proper product handling and the food legislation, specifically around product labeling and notification to SQFI and the certification body in the event of a recall. And then CAPA processes, which we haven't talked a lot about yet, but you do want to make sure that you have an effective corrective action and preventative action process and use those when necessary. So hopefully you have some type of methodology to use a 5Y process or an 8D process or other type of root cause analysis process so you can really identify what was the root cause of that problem to be able to show that you took effective preventative measures to keep it from happening again and hopefully be able to avoid to show the fact that you're fighting the same issues over and over again. So Corrective actions and preventive actions are a crucial component of your food safety and quality systems as well. And then we talked about the food defense plan, particularly with the new challenge test and compliance with the FISMA intentional adulteration rule that's coming up as a requirement for smaller, for smaller facilities in July of this year. 
And then last, of course, we've talked about the infrastructure to make sure that we maintain the walls, the doors, the floors, the ceilings, and the drains in a sanitary manner. On these next slides, let's switch from the food safety audit to quality audits. So this part would only be applicable to those companies that are certified to the SQF quality code and to the SQF food safety code. But I'm going to take just a quick minute and share some non major nonconformances and minor nonconformances related to these quality audits in the event that that's part of the, your scope of certification as well. And as you can see, similar to the food safety plan, it's the food quality plan that accounts for three of the top 10 major nonconformances. That the issue being normally the food quality plans not properly documented in terms of identifying all the right quality threats during that quality threat risk analysis process, and that the companies often haven't identified all of the critical quality points that could be associated with that process. And you can see from the other two issues around the food quality plan, the issues are specifically around those critical quality points to make sure that you've identified the right types of critical quality points. And those are the ones that should correlate with your product specification. So if there's an important attribute in your product specification, it should also be addressed in your food quality plan as a critical quality point. And then once you identify that, then of course you have to have validated limits for those. And then of course you have to do the monitoring uh, at the frequencies that are specified as well. Some other major issues around the food quality plants and SQF quality code conformance would include the SPC control charts where you'd actually have upper control limits and lower control limits identified for key processes to be able to demonstrate that you're keeping the process under control. And then around your internal audit process that you do actually have to have a separate internal audit plan that's specific to your food quality plan that would be different than the one that would be used for your building and facility and your food safety plan. And then under 2122, it talks about management responsibility. And one of the items that causes many companies nonconformances is the fact that you have to identify quality objectives in addition to food safety objectives, but specific objectives that you wanna meet with a goal set and then be able to measure that on a regular process as well. And that also ties to the management review nonconformance that you see here because the management review for food quality is totally different than the management review for food safety. And as you look at these codes and compare them, there's very specific things that you need to talk about during the quality review that's different than the food safety review itself. And then the minor nonconformances that are related to quality audits, similar to some of the same issues related to the food quality plans and internal audits and management reviews that we just talked about, but a few other items that you see on here include the training program. So you do have to actually have to have training for some of your key personnel for statistical process controls. And then this one under 2411 talks about customer requirements. And you do have to have procedures in place that define what your customer expectations are for both product and delivery and do an annual review of that process. And many companies fail to document that annual review very well. And then last on this list would be the food fraud vulnerability assessment. And in this case, you would have to address potential food fraud hazards, not only from a food safety standpoint, but also those that could create an economic adulterant in your supply. Okay, so a little bit deeper dive on the food quality plan, very similar to what we talked about, the food safety plan. So I'm not gonna take a lot of time to go over this in more detail, but again, you wanna make sure that you have your food quality team documented and document the training that you've given to those individuals that again, they do meet on a quarterly basis at least or more frequently if necessary. And then that you have all the components of the food quality plan. And notice instead of a hazard analysis, we call this a quality threat risk analysis. So you have to address all the potential quality threats to the process as part of that document and then ultimately identify your critical quality points from there and then make sure that you're completing all of the records and ultimately you have to do an annual review and again we recommend a third party reassessment of those food quality plans also. And then I think we've talked about these other types of non-conformances so I'm not going to go into this slide in any other 
detail. Okay, in the next presentation, let's take a moment and talk about some of the steps to take for nonconformances. So once a nonconformance has been identified during an audit, let's focus on what action we want to take during the audit itself and then after the audit to make sure that it's followed up on properly. So during the audit, one of the best things that you can do is make sure that you stay in close communication with the auditor. And if an auditor does identify a nonconformance, make sure that you both clearly understand what the nature of the nonconformance is. And once you're in agreement as to what the nature of the nonconformance is, go back and take a look at the specific language that's in the standard itself to really compare are you in compliance with the code or if you're not in compliance, what part are you now in violation on? So you can decide whether you're in agreement with the auditor about that or consider whether or not that's something you may dispute or potentially want to appeal at a later time. Whenever a nonconformance is identified, it's always wise to take pictures of those noncompliant areas. This would be you as a company and not allowing the auditor to take pictures, but you would want to take a picture of the before condition and the after condition, and that's a great way to be able to include those pictures with the corrective action response to be able to show that the issue has been resolved. The next point is to make sure that you correct nonconformances as soon as possible and show the auditor that you have a proper commitment and sponsorship to your food safety system. If an auditor does find a problem during the audit, he does have the right to cite it as a nonconformance, even if you fix it while he's there during the audit. But if you will show that the auditor that you're taking a timely response and that you do have a good commitment, then there may be some consideration that might be given concerning that situation. And then last, I would encourage you to ask the auditor for an exit meeting each day after each day of the audit to make sure that you're in agreement, that you understand the results and you understand what type of nonconformances have been identified. And then ultimately, what type of ratings may be assessed during the final exit meeting. The most important thing is to make sure that you don't get to the exit meeting and have a surprise to where something comes out during the exit meeting that you weren't notified about during the course of the audit itself. And then after the audit, you do have a typically a 30-day window of time to be able to submit the corrective actions to the nonconformances that have been identified. So during that period of time, you want to work not only just by the QA manager by themselves, but actually work with your entire food safety team to determine what are the appropriate corrective actions to take for each one of the nonconformances that have been identified. I would actually encourage you to document a full CAPA process for each one of those nonconformances that would help you identify the root cause and what the right type of corrective actions and preventive measures you can take to be sufficient for each nonconformance identified. And then you'll have to complete the corrective action forms that are required by the certification body. And as part of that, you can upload your completed CAPA documents along with the pictures that you've taken. And then make sure that you submit those corrective actions to the certification body, typically, definitely before the deadline, but usually a week, at least a week prior to that deadline as well. So if you need some additional time to resolve something, you'll have that time available for you. And then, of course, you can follow up with the auditor to make sure that the nonconformances are closed properly so your certificates can be reissued as necessary. And then make sure that you do appeal if warranted. A lot of companies question whether or not they should appeal a nonconformance. And it really just depends on the individual specific situation. I mean, one is if you completely disagree with a nonconformance, certainly would be a time to appeal. Uh, but then if uh, an appeal of one or two nonconformances may make a, a big determination as to whether or not you could get an excellent versus a good rating or a good rating versus a comply rating, then it would probably be in your best interest to appeal those where necessary. Now, in this next section of the presentation, we're going to talk about best practices for ensuring compliance. The first thing you can do that will help you the most is to make sure that you know fully and understand what the standard requirements are. So you know what the scope of the certification for the audit is going to be. If it's going to be SQF edition 8.1 for the food safety code for manufacturing, or if it's going to be the SQF quality code, or potentially one of the other food sectors that could be involved for packaging or storage and distribution, but make sure you actually know the standard and that you've actually read through that entire standard. So you know 
what you are going to be audited against and do your own gap analysis to compare if you feel like you're in compliance with that requirement or not. And then if you're not, then make sure that you're taking corrective action to bring yourself into compliance. And then secondly, anytime the standards are updated, make sure that you pay particular and close attention to the new program requirements. And all of the standards will publish what they call a change log document. So it'll show you specifically what's been added to or changed or taken away from the standard. So focus on that as well. And then take training where needed to be able to meet the requirements or raise your awareness. So if you think it may be helpful for you to take a basic or advanced HACCP course or a PCQI course or one of the implementing SQF or SQF quality courses, or even statistical process control. Make sure that you've taken all the training you need to be able to demonstrate that you're going to be competent in these areas and then learn from the standard owners and others experience, just like this presentation, so you can prevent these types of mistakes in your own facility. Next, we talked about the internal audit process being your best friend, and it definitely can be. Ideally, you know, an auditor should never point out something as a nonconformance that you didn't know about already. And the best way to know about those things would be through your internal audit process. So make sure that you've got a good internal audit team. It's a multidisciplinary team. So it includes representative from QA and operations and maintenance and sanitation and other departments as needed and train those auditors so they know what they need to look for during that internal audit process and then next, make sure that you create a documented internal audit schedule that's going to show specifically what areas of your plant or which programs need to be audited at what time frames to make sure that over the course of an entire year that you've audited your entire system and that you're also auditing your facility itself and the employees and the GMPs at least on a monthly basis as well. And then I would encourage you to actually complete and document, you know, a clause by clause gap analysis. You can typically download these from the program owner website and actually do your own gap analysis or an internal audit checklist to be able to look at each of those requirements and again assess whether you're in compliant or not in compliant in any area that you're not in compliant. Go ahead and take time to document that on a corrective action register and then be able to demonstrate how you came back into compliance with that requirement. And then, of course, you do have to do plant inspections as part of your internal audit process. And during these plant inspections, not just an inspection of your building and facility and your equipment, but it should also include interviews with your employees and watching your employees to see how they're handling the products as well and their GMP compliance. So you wanna make sure that you're doing those plan inspections at least on a monthly basis. And then to make sure that you have an effective process in place to communicate those internal audit results to senior management to keep them informed and also to ask them for the resources that you need to make sure that your food safety and quality systems are working effectively. But again, you wanna make sure that there shouldn't be any surprises during the audit. The food safety plan, we've already talked about the importance of that, so I'm not going to dwell on that any longer, but make sure that it is fully documented, fully implemented, and fully validated, and especially zero in on your flowcharts, the correlation of that flowchart with your hazard analysis, and making sure that you've identified all the correct hazards, the right critical control points or preventive controls, and that you have validated critical limits for those as well. And then to make sure that you document that reassessment process, at least on an annual basis, but also you want to do it whenever there's significant changes, CCP failures, unanticipated hazards, and when new information becomes available. In the next section of the presentation, we want to talk about audit preparation and readiness. So in this area, we want to talk about some of the things that you can do before the audit to make sure that you're going to be well ready when the audit comes itself. And one of the best things you can do is start with training all your employees, uh, you know, at least within a month or preferably even within a week of your recertification audit dates. Make sure that you do awareness training with your employees on good manufacturing practices, HACCP, the GFSI standard requirements, if you have to have a policy statement and other specific things to the standards themselves. So all those questions that an auditor is going to typically ask your employees 
make sure that you've covered with them as well and make sure that they're going to be prepared to give a good response during that interview process. In addition to that, I would conduct a HACCP or a food safety team meeting at least a week prior to the audit. So all the members on that team are also prepared for interview questions so that they can answer questions about why did you identify particular types of hazards, where are the CCPs or the preventive controls, and what type of monitoring you have. So each member needs to be prepared for an interview to be able to explain what their role in the process is. And then third, you want to make sure that you're doing a very detailed plant inspection that includes not only, again, the building and the facility, but also the equipment, the employees, the sanitation, and the maintenance issues to make sure that they're properly identified and corrected prior to the audit. And if you have any unused equipment, I would take that out of your production areas. So the less there is to inspect, the less opportunity there may be for a problem. And then schedule your pest control operator the day prior to the audit to make sure there's no unexpected pest issues. And then, of course, check in your storage areas and be able to schedule projects during the days of the audit that's going to have minimal waste and ease of processing. So Another key component of getting ready for the audit is to coach your personnel. And this is one of the things that we do with all of our consulting clients to really help them demonstrate commitment to their food safety system and the competency of all the employees that are involved in this process. So you know that the auditor is going to talk to your QA technicians. You know they're going to talk to your CCP or your preventive control personnel. And you know they'll talk to certain line operators and supervisors, maintenance, sanitation, receiving, and shipping. So you want to make sure that you have all of those employees ready to competently explain their responsibilities and to be able to show how they fill out any forms that they complete as part of that job. So put your role self in the role of the auditor and do some mock interviews with your employees and make sure and get that they understand those responsibilities and that they can communicate them properly and that they become comfortable with the interview process itself. So ultimately, you want all of your employees to be able to understand and explain what is being audited, what are their requirements, especially around GMPs, for when do they wash their hands, when do they change their gloves, how do they handle their products, and then those job-specific responsibilities as well. And then a few key tips for during the audit itself is you should demonstrate proper sponsorship and actually have a formal entrance and closing meeting with the auditor and with attendance by the senior management there to communicate their commitment to food safety and each of the departmental managers. And that way the auditor can start to develop a relationship and know who he's going to be talking to or she over the course of the audit process. And then make sure that you run lines at appropriate speeds so you can handle the product properly. And one of the key tips is actually we encourage clients to have an advanced team inspecting ahead of the auditor. So you're going to have an audit team that's going to include the auditor, the QA manager, probably a maintenance supervisor as well at a minimum. But even going ahead of them, you should have a small multidisciplinary team that's, you know, walking one or two departments ahead of wherever you know that auditor is going to, to put out any last minute fires that could be coming up. Uh, to help head off some of those problems that you possibly can. And then you do want to have the QA, the operations, the maintenance, and preferably even a sanitation person that can actually walk with the auditor during the audit itself and then address any issues that may be identified during the audit. And then make sure that you have all the proper product handling and allergen handling and labeling in all areas ready to go. And another good tip is just do not allow contractors in your plant on the day of the audits. One of my worst audit experiences with one of our consulting clients was when we started the audit in a receiving department and a con contractor comes walking through the receiving door, equipment, no hairnet, no clothing, cup of coffee, open cup of coffee in their hands, and then the audit just kind of went downhill from there. So, you know, if you can avoid having contractors in the plant, then that would be even better. And again, remember to take pictures and details of any nonconformities that are identified. And the very last thing I want to do real quickly is just share a few Intertech Alchemy resources that may be available and helpful to you. Of course, Alchemy is best known for our training platform. And the training platform gives you a great library of both food safety and workplace safety courses that you can provide to your employees to meet 
FDA, USDA, and regulatory requirements and audit requirements. And it's delivered in a very engaging way where each employee has a remote in their hand and they have to answer questions throughout the training to demonstrate the effectiveness of the training. And the Alchemy Manager system helps you electronically manage all of those training records that are so difficult in many companies. And you can use the other Alchemy solutions, including our coach application, digital signage and huddle talk guides and posters to be able to reinforce those concepts. And the Alchemy Manager system will keep all of those records for you in place as well. And then last, of course, I'm the vice president of our consulting. I'm very proud of our consulting team, that we have a great group of individuals all across the country that work throughout North America to help clients with their needs for regulatory compliance with FDA and USDA, and then also for GFSI compliance to either become initially certified, but also to sustain and continuously improve their certification as well, and then to do any type of food safety training that you need that we can either do instructor-led training on-site at your facility itself, or we also have the Alchemy Academy available for our e-learning platform for all of those types of courses that you may need to take as well, including PCQI, basic and advanced HACCP as well, and many other courses, including internal auditor courses. So thank you very much for joining me today. I appreciate the opportunity to share this information to you. And if we can help you with any of the resources that we talked about, please feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jeff Chilton, for that in-depth presentation. And thank you for watching. Uh, within the food safety sector. And that concludes this presentation.